We're a venture capital fund of funds. Been around for years. How much risk is it that a couple of your funds don't perform? Venture's more risky inherently. 450 funds, 100 managers. When you're looking at a new manager, are you just looking for pure alpha who can make the best decisions? The dirty little secret of venture capital is that you want all the best talent to stay, help grow a growth stage company, but those make some of the best founders. So people aggressively target that talent. Every venture pitch you get is pretty exciting and interesting. No one boring really starts a venture fund. It's the top 5% of society. Ben, welcome to the 10X Capital Podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, so what is top tier capital? We're a venture capital fund of funds. Firm's been around for years. Offices, San Francisco, Boston. I just moved down outside of New York. And then we have an office in London as well. How critical are you guys to be on the ground next to your managers? It's a relationship thing. So I mean, back in uh, when the firm started, like everybody wanted access to Silicon Valley tech. And for us to have a local presence, feed on the street and, and be seen in the market was super important to our global LP base just to, to get the real truth of what's going on, I think we have a, a firm wide belief that it's important to be local in the markets that matter. And what's your products look like? I know you have uh, the primary fund of funds, but what, what other products do you have? The last investment cycle is about a billion five. So two thirds of that is primary capital. So investments into venture funds. Um, we only do venture across all of that. So uh, five to 10 million dollar checks into kind of new relationships, new managers, emerging managers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, up to kind of 20 to 40 and, and more brand name stuff. And then the other third of our billion five this last cycle was set or is secondaries and direct investments. And so we'll do all different sorts of secondaries, where, whether that be LP stakes, GP stakes, direct company, secondaries, uh, all over the map. And then for, for the equity checks and co-investments, what we call it, that's predominantly series B, C-ish tech companies, a lot of enterprise tech, some consumer over the years, biotech's been tough for us to kind of wrap our heads around and, and leave that to the experts uh, most days. So the team is split really. So you either uh, predominantly focus on primaries or pre predominantly focus on secondaries and directs. And so I spend my time on the, the primary side of the business, but the reality is, is, is we're co-investors and we only invest in things from our, our own book on the secondary and direct side. And so when things come in through somebody's relationship on the primary side, it gets passed over the secondary side for underwriting, but you're still on a kind of deal team for relationship management, let's say. That's Q3 2024. What kind of secondary opportunities are in the market? I mean, I think it's a lot of people trying to figure out uh, what value is and, and what what people are, are willing to part with. I think everyone last year thought there was going to be a huge rush to sell secondaries and, oh, what a time to be buying and you can get things for 50 off. Like, Reality is not that much volume traded in the venture market. And it's because, I mean, 2022, the venture market was down like 35% from highs. And so if I'm a CIO sitting there looking at cleaning up my book, like I'm going to be down 35% and then take another 50% haircut and sell it for some cash, like I think we'll just wait. And, and I think they were probably right to do that. And so today, I mean, when you see uh, portfolios being traded, they're kind of in the 25-ish discount. I mean, you still see the occasional 50% where somebody just doesn't want to be in a manager anymore or maybe a CIO regime change and they just don't buy venture. They don't care. They want to rotate whatever cash they can. You see a bit of that, but for the most part, uh, the venture market on the secondary side, and now I'm talking LP stakes, uh, yeah. all these discounts. Uh, the LP stakes, I mean, really, yeah, call it 2025 20, up to 35, 40. 20, 25 up to 35 of the last valuation, last quarter. Yeah, yeah. So everything prices off a quarter end NAV, basically. So we get our capital account balance uh, for you know, Q2 here in a couple of weeks. And, and so then I could take that pricing and say like it's 35% discount off of that. Some people, you'll hear people say like, oh, it traded at 85 cents on the dollar or something. Well, that's a 15% discount. Like the lingo. Curious, why are discounts so high given that there are quite a few secondary buyers coming down for sure. But a lot of the AUM um, for people who buy secondaries has gone into strategies focused on buyout and growth stage companies. I mean, these profitable businesses, uh, it is not uncommon to see those things trade at 5% uh, discounts. So 95 cents on the dollar. I mean, I was just talking to a broker Tuesday, the competition you see in the big broker trades for the, the buyout stuff is five to 15% discount where venture still 
uh, 25 to 35. And they're still, I mean, venture's more risky inherently. And, and the, the marks might not be as accurate, correct? So we're a fund of funds. We're invested in 100 managers. We have 450 active underlying funds on our platform. So we actually track the stat. And it's one of the most asked for things from our managers of like, hey, like, can you blind my book and just say relative to all the other managers who have uh, an investment in our underlying company is like, where do I sit? And you, there's a couple outliers for sure. Uh, every time you look at those and like, you know, a, one manager maybe has more confidence in the company than another, et cetera. But for the most part, people are pretty close these days. Or we know that some firms just inherently don't care and they won't mark their book up no matter what the operating metrics are from last round price. And they just leave it there until, I mean, the company goes public. You're in 450 funds, 100 managers. When you're looking at a new manager, are you thinking about how is this uh, has a diverse set of assets or are you just looking for pure alpha who could make the best decisions? We only add two to three new managers in our probably core portfolio every two to three years. So there's not a lot of um, rotation in our book and um, a lot of it's because people perform well and they stay. Um, and, and so like when I'm adding a new manager, I mean, I have to think about how is that different from what I already have? Because I'm kind of assuming, luckily, you're fortunately for a young guy to, to join a fund of funds platform, that we have access to some of the best venture capitalists in the world already today. And so what's going to be different and new and how does that fit into my book? Are you somehow looking at their assets versus other assets, like whether they're doing SaaS and consumer and you have too much exposure to SaaS or consumer? How do you say we missed like a big winner in our portfolio like say we weren't in uber indirectly and we had some um but like say we weren't and there are a bunch of spin outs coming from those companies and some other vcs are just capitalize on that talent because let's face it the dirty little secret of venture capital is that uh yeah you want all the best talent to stay and help grow a growth stage company but those make some of the best founders. And, and so like people aggressively target that talent. We look periodically of like, hey, which companies are we missing in recent kind of vintages and, and who are the VCs that are capitalizing on that? And then we'll go try to get in front of them. Sometimes it's, you know, a early product person who got into venture and is on their fund two or fund three and has examples of this sort of thing. Or it, it is the VC who did that deal, doubling down on the winners. Intuitively, it would appear, it, you would think that serial entrepreneurs have a leg up to these kind of former, you know, employee number five at Uber, to okay. an AI. But to your point, a lot of the big winners end up being from these ecosystems. Why do you think that is? Some of it is just building an early team. Like if you can go start uh, a company with three of your buddies who you know are excellent operators and are in the trenches and frankly hungry like they're not already wealthy but they want to go change the world and be a part of the next big thing like that makes that initial five person team all the more dangerous in our eyes it de-risks it and also sets the culture yeah there's a corollary where david sachs uh the first, first like 30 angel investments were just friends he knew the people completely de-rested. He has one of the best kind of angel track records because he has one of the best angel track records in the world. Yeah. I, <laughs> you, you sound like you know more about well, it. Well, we did, I, we I did, we did craft fun one. Uh, so him and, and Bill coming together and launching that. Like I, I, I hope uh, David and Bill are fine. That's, that's good. My, sword, my sources that's amazing. are amazing. Yeah. And, and a lot of fun to be a part of. You do invest in fund ones. So tell me about, well, when would you back a fund one? So emerging manager, I kind of like, said in, in almost like a air quotes earlier. So we we don't internally think of us backing emerging managers. Like it's just too hard for, for our platform to really get excited about folks who don't really have a track record. I mean, you're being compared against index and Excel. And it's like, well, why, you know, why do you deserve to win? And like, what's your spot in the market? And so when we talk about backing a fund one, it's usually someone like a David Sachs who has an amazing track record wants to institutionalize uh, either as you know, family office, private activity, and like, hey, he's all in on being a venture capitalist now, uh, or it's someone who has left one of the big brand firms who uh, is going to, you know, generally they talk about just not wanting to deal with like the, the scope of a platform and want to really focus on either one sector uh, or, you know, one stage and not worry about the like later stage follow on activity, et cetera. Like, we see that a lot and, and we'll back those sorts of managers. So for example, we backed Tomas at Theory. We were in fund one there. We did West Chan at FPB, folks like that when they spin out and they're just fantastic 
investors that that we know we want to be a part of it. Just to play devil's advocate, there's certainly persistence in venture capital returns and you're in a lot of great funds, but can you really just go to these funds and continuously upside? Aren't you basically capped in your top name? So our fund of funds, like 70% of our underlying dollars, if you look at it on a strategy basis, go into seed or in series A focused strategies. And so as platforms have raised AUM, and most of that AUM growth has been on later stage of follow on activity. Like if we scaled with a bunch of those groups, like our product mix would effectively change for our clients, our LPs. And so we worry about that a lot. You know, at a certain point, our clients can go and buy those platforms directly and we're happy to make those introductions and maybe they should, but then maybe it's just not a fit for, for us anymore. And so our, you know, our kind of core fund of funds has actually stayed pretty consistent in size for the last 10 years sort of thing. And so you, you'd see 20 to $30 million commitments in there across the platform. And then uh, excess capacity goes to uh, one of our separately managed accounts that sits as an overflow vehicle on top of our stuff. Who would, who would like more of that type of uh, investment? You mentioned your clients. Who are clients that invest into venture fund of funds? What are some of those categories? A couple categories for us. I mean, we are almost exclusively large pension retirement systems globally. I mean, half our money comes from the U.S. Uh, and then the other half internationally. So uh, you know, Germany, South Korea, Japan. So f- folks like that who thinks, think of us as venture experts who will help them manage their venture allocation. And so those are the large checks. And so then they're just like, hey, here's our venture allocation. We might hire two venture fund of funds and you guys go figure it out and get me into the best managers. Uh, And then there's a cohort of LP that wants us to help with access. And since our founding of our firm, we always have inherent churn in our LP base because it's part of our business model. So they'll give us a primary commitment and we'll help it for maybe like two funds in a row. And then we'll help them with introductions to managers. Um, And it's always up to the manager to let them in, certainly. But... Uh, and we don't make a lot of promises there because it just, it is what it is. But, you know, the reality is, is it's worked and people will take their money uh, and it's a way to get smart on the space and then eventually build off their their program directly. And we're totally happy to do that. Are those family offices, endowments? Yeah, endowment, smaller endowments or or maybe, um, you know, some, some international funds that know they don't have access in the U.S. and they want it. We're happy to, to help them get up to speed, maybe kind of to the, the way we start up the, the feet on the street and, and know the market, like they're, they're willing to pay someone to, to help them figure it out. You mentioned when we last chat, you, that you don't chase sector funds for us. And this is a house view. It's that we kind of view venture and innovation as, as people finding opportunities at the fringes. Maybe, maybe it's where two sectors collide and then bam, you have a new business model or a, a new method of distribution, et cetera. And like, those are the big wins. And so as we think about like sectors, like it's really hard for us to not imagine that the general SVCs wouldn't, wouldn't end up in some of like the most interesting collisions of sectors and finding the coolest opportunities because they're just good at BC and they know a lot of people have been successful. I will caveat that with saying we, we do have really two sectors on our, our platform that we will invest in or are investing in today. One is biotech and that's like no, 10, 15 percent of our book. And then the other is cybersecurity. The way we've kind of gotten there is that we think you kind of need some of the gray hair in the room when you're talking to like the customers of those two businesses. Like Big Pharma is not going to just like pick up the phone to any VC who invests in biotech companies. Like you need to have some gravitas to get in front of the decision makers there. It's just the truth. And cybersecurity, we knew for us that it's a sector biotech goes back to like 99 being, you know, about 15% of the book. But but recently, we kind of came to the conclusion that cybersecurity, you need that same, I'm using the term gravitas, to get in front of CISOs and, and the importance of decision makers who can really move the needle for an early stage company. Hey, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Our sponsor for today's episode is Carta, the end-to-end accounting platform purposely built for fund CFOs. For the first time ever, private fund operators can leverage their very own bespoke software that's designed from the ground up to bring their whole portfolio together. This enables formations, transactions, and distributions to flow seamlessly and accurately to limited partners. The end result is a remarkably fast and precise platform that empowers better strategic decision-making and delivers transformational insights on demand. Come see the new standard in private fund management 
at z.carta.com forward slash 10 xpod that's z.carta.com forward slash 10 xpod so we chatted last time about the pros and cons uh, when you're in a situation where you have one more vintage where you think that the fund could d- really deliver very well would you invest knowing that it's a one and done and we're already existing lps you're not existing they're probably unlikely the reality is we have to monitor these funds for 15 18 years anyways and i mean if i can't hand over my heart say that i think i can get two to three commitment cycles with a manager, like we're just not adding a new relationship. So how often do you not commit to the second or third vintage? I could count on one hand in like the eight and a half-ish years that I've been here, how many times it's happened. And that's been due to something that specifically happened or what are those cases? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just changing strategy to something. If you started a seed fund and you raised 150 and then like you come back and had great success and you're raising like 450 and you want to go be multi-stage, like we might have a pause at that one. Um, I would say the number two reason would be team. Uh, I mean, certainly if there's a bunch of team turnover and uh, it's just not the same story and pitch, like that's hard to get behind because it's such a personal business. What are some other reasons that venture franchises decline over time? I mean, just senior partners who have made a lot of money and are really doing the deals. And it's just a bunch of junior folks who don't know how to make money in the business of venture capital that get the keys to the car. Do you believe venture could function out of office or do you think that you have to be in office to be a good venture firm today? Now, I do think fundraising would be really tough. Uh, And just there's a trust element to it. I mean, so like, yeah, I do pitch your strategy totally great. Um, I understand it. It's in the meeting note. I get it. But there's just something about breaking bread with somebody and sitting down and and having an in-person conversation uh, that I just don't think changes um, that quickly in in this business because there's such a opportunity cost for making the wrong decision here. Like if you, you know, are one of the big platforms and you invest in what you, you know, you invest in like the number five winner versus the number one or two winner in the category. Like that's just, a, a, and then you can't invest in the number one or two because you're conflicted, whatever. Like, I just don't think people are going to be so willing to, to take it only on Zoom. Just to play devil's advocate, I, I do think in person is really, I think venture more than anything. And like many asset management fields is an apprenticeship model. Sure. And you just imagine, you know, you have a carpenter and they're doing it virtually. It's very difficult. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that's a very physical thing. But I think some of the greatest venture managers, the next generation, tend to be from in-office cultures. There's a lot of truth to what you're saying. And I mean, top tier, as I'm saying, you can do it remote. Like we still were two days in the office. And we actually, we hired kids out of college every couple of years. That's how I lucked into it. Yeah. And for the first year, like you don't get to go to a lot of conferences. Like you don't, like your job is to learn the book, which I mean, we have a lot of active portfolio companies yeah. and a lot of active managers. So that, that's, it's all a task. Uh, I'd love to see if any of our analysts right now could, could talk to our entire book. But um, until you're being an LP and like, till you know enough to be dangerous and probably this is true for a lot of VCs, like, like you probably really shouldn't be representing your firm. Like you manage people's retirement money and like that reputation has built over years. And so until like our junior people can kind of talk the talk and, and we know we're going to have a good answer for like, Hey, what's an LP look for? Like, what are the things with my venture fund I should be thinking about? Like until you can prove that, like, you know, we're not sure. You're in 450 funds. Um, I'm assuming you don't know all 10,000. I know you're very smart, but probably there's limitations. set. Oh, totally. So how do you talk about your book and... How do you talk about top tier when you when you talk to LPs or at conferences? Sure. Like we have a standing thing that we get together as an investment team and we review quarterly new deal activity. And so it'd be like, how many companies, at what stages, what was the average check size, like the managers who do provide ownership percents, like well, how does that tick up and down? And this is kind of a scoreboard. What are some of the things you're tracking there? Uh, yeah, average entry price, ownership percent. Um, size of rounds. Maybe people be curious. Uh, Q Q one twenty three versus Q124 is actually about the same invested capital on like a look-through basis of our managers. Uh, but if you look this year, there was more of a shift to uh, seed and series A stage. Uh, so the number of investments was higher, which like for us is a good early indicator that the venture industry is like really kind of like, at least with like, you know, premier venture managers, which maybe I'm saying yeah. arrogantly, but um, you know, those top folks here, those are the top tier, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, those managers are back to works writing early stage checks versus trying to follow on into some of their winners or, um, uh, you know, 
huge, huge sums of capital into like a couple big AI deals last year. Whereas this year, we saw a lot more kind of back to basics. And um, I think it bodes well for for the industry here over the next 18 months that that there's such a there was such an increase. You mentioned AI. Do you have any early views on, on the ecosystem on what you see, you know, through your manager? Well, real revenue pulling through these businesses, but it's still TBD if that's just fickle revenue of people just trying to figure out which tools they want. Um, it's totally unclear who's going to be category winners. It's obvious that there's an enterprise budget for these these corporate tools solving like real pain points. The problem is when you see like three companies show up that are solving the same thing in our fund of funds book and we're just like, all right, like who's going to win? Like all three are going to be winners. It's just reality of business. You said last time we chatted, our clients hire us because we have people that will tell us the truth. Maybe feed on the street. We'll go back to that. But uh, it, it's references are such important. If you listen to any LP talk about investing in venture, I mean, they talk about how important references are. Well, like if I was starting a fund of funds today and was just like cold start like i'm gonna go get into the best venture managers like every venture pitch you get is pretty exciting and like interesting like no no one boring really starts a venture fund it's the top five percent of society the worst manager is the top five (laughs) they're just really smart interesting people um and i think you get caught up and just like man this this is obvious this is going to be a winner and uh, we talk to all our junior people about this, like it totally. And I had the same experience, like the funds that I thought day one were like super interesting, obviously great. We're like, yeah, that's cool. But like, wait until you meet all of our managers who come through our office. And I think you'll understand why our book looks the way it does. And like that then is the bar that you have to compare new relationships to. And then those are the people that I get to call to tell me the truth about the other managers and their ecosystem. And like, Hey, is that seed manager really getting into all these deals? Are they getting into your shittiest 20% of deals? Yeah. They're just scraping the bottom of your phone. Those people tell us the truth. It, I mean, they're friends of the firm over time, absolutely. And and we we look to them um, uh, to help us continue to make money. In terms of your relationship with these top funds outside of being an LP, what care do you have to give them to kind of maintain and strengthen their relationship? I hope people view us as knowing what we're talking about when you sit down with somebody on top tier like with the access to the data that we have like what i hope and what the firm spends a lot of time thinking about is like being a trusted partner for them and you know the the money's next right like everybody's nice to to lps totally yeah i mean the ability to run lpacs for like two-thirds of our managers and stuff like that like we just can sit down and be like, hey, that's market or like, yeah, you guys actually are doing a great job or you're light on DPI. I'm like, we're just going to tell you the truth. And I think people respect that. I hope people respect that. Do you find that the people that are most open to feedback, your top managers somewhere in the middle or talk to me about the correlation between? VC is super curious people. Like as soon as they know we have uh, some benchmark thing that like will come up in a meeting, they always want to see like they always want to uh, to figure out where they stack. So you lead with data, not with well, not with ego, essentially. These most of the firms we invest in are not like you know again first time managers, whatever. Like we're we're all we're happy to help on operational stuff, all that. And, but like we've kind of got that figured out at this point. It's like how do you tweak things at the fringes uh, to to win? And so like the scout programs, uh, I don't know what eight years ago when everybody was doing that, it was like okay, like what's best in class? Like how do I go keep up? Was that a failed experiment? Honestly, some of those like buckets have performed well, but I don't know. And I'd love to see the data on this. We should probably, I should talk to some other fund of funds and like we should figure it out. But like, I would love to see the success rate of the VCs doubling down on the winners from their scout portfolio. Cause they, cause there's, I mean, many portfolios of hundreds of companies sometimes and really hard to figure out which ones are working so early on. And then how do you go from your 150K check that your operator that you gave money to to invest this company uh, is really the one that I should go and back up the truck and put $4 million like super seed in or whatever we want to call it. Are you not concerned that you guys are a market beta given you're in 10,000 companies and how do you assess that out? Yeah, I mean, that's worry. Sure. Uh, with a fund of funds. I mean, we try to benchmark ourselves against the uh, the... Cambridge USBC benchmark. Fund of funds and secondary benchmarks are a little wacky because it's together. So, so yeah. But mo- most fund of funds actually, I mean, I've seen some of the numbers and a lot of them are public. Like they've, they've done pretty well relative to the market. Why do you think that is? I mean, access to the best name. Persistence is certainly, I mean, statistically like does exist in our industry. Sure. Um, willingness to probably take a little more risk. 
uh, than, than other folks in the asset class as well. I mean, it's, you know, I have a $50 million minimum check size. Like I'm limited uh, on the new I can go for. And that's probably a, maybe a, a platform where I'm a little more later stage focus. And it's like kind of an obvious buy. Uh, that, that certainly, I'm saying all this about platforms. Some of the platforms are our best performers. So like, I, I don't want to get that loss in the conversation. Yeah. D- David Clark said the same thing. He said that David Clark from Vencap said that his highest performing fund ever was a growth fund. Yeah. Why not? What do you look at the future of a fund of funds in your industry? Any new products, any new approaches for us? We went to Europe, which was new. We spun our European allocation out in 2019, 2020, historic, like we've been investing there since 2004, I think. And we just saw what was going on in Asia, probably China specifically. Um, we just saw the quality of company and, and even, I mean, our US VC being like, yeah, we love investing in European companies where you can get it for a bit of a discount. And then they immediately come move to New York or, or Silicon Valley. Like, yeah, why would we not? They're just really good technical teams. And then if you look at the underlying data on the European continent, I mean, the seed and series A round, I think it's something I'll probably misquote it. Our European team will correct me, uh, after this, but it's like, 85 percent of the dollars uh done is from a regional local manager at that uh at that round and so if you're thinking of just like dollar cost averaging into a strong tech ecosystem like that's where you want to be and the local guys are just commanding the market and the u.s folks are coming in at the series b so you don't have existing exposure into it yeah and so we're like we're getting in at the b like that's cool but like we might as well go buy it at the seed if we can as a fund of funds and so we we launched that strategy and i mean some of those firms absolutely compete on a relative performance basis like with a historical track record with our u.s relationships as a fund of fund are you able to pursue pure alpha in other words are you penalized of one of your funds has a 0.5x if overall you're doing really well and how much is it yeah how much how much risk is it that one of your funds or a couple of your funds don't perform just like looking at on maybe the other side like it's really hard to pick which of our we kind of have like 25 managers per 550 600 million dollar uh on the fund size like just if you go so like it's hard to pick on any given fund which of those 25 is going to be the huge outperformer and so like the opportunity cost is really like okay, which one is going to be the screaming home run? And like, what do you think about portfolio construction? Like I would be, I have, I would love to ask our partners and myself, like if you only have one fund and like you, it had to be over three X net, like who hand over your heart this cycle, would you put the money in? Like that's tough to do. And so for us, I mean, taking that basket approach with, with the upside opportunity is probably more how we think about it than worrying about the downside. Is there a power lot to investing in funds? Otherwise, is it right tail skewed? Or is it about like, do you expect one of your funds to, to return a 10, 15 X or does that not? No, I think it happens. Sure. Some of the seed funds have like crazy, uh, huge multiples, but no, we, we don't think about it like that. I mean, if you're a five X net plus venture fund, like you are, you're crushing it and you should be really happy about that. Um, so the, like just the number of company and you know, we kind of got on this. So like, I think since our 2008 fund of funds, we just did this over the summer. Uh, since our 2008 fund of funds, like, oh, uh, you could say on average, like a thousand to 1200 companies and each of our fund of funds every couple of years at scale or at maturity, like 18 to 25 companies, max, they make up like two thirds of the value. And then the next tail to get you up to like 90% of value is only like another hundred companies. And so 10%, it's like kind of a 10 and 90. The 18 to 25 account for 75%. And I think it's 18 to like 23, I think was the stat, uh, account for like two thirds of the value. How does that inform your strategy? If folks don't have, and this is talking about maybe some of the venture math and like, how do you make money in venture? If a VC can't sit down with me and have a really clear, like eyes wide open conversation of how much you need to own upfront. Like what the sort of business can, I'll just like pick a company and be like, oh, hey, like, you know, this company seems cool. Like how, walk me through how that like return your fund or like how that's a substantial driver. And so, uh, as you're like talking about the finance side of life, if, if the VC can have a really clear, like, oh, we bought this much upfront, we think the market is, you know, huge, whatever, and we can scale it to this amount of revenue and sell it for this return. And, and at that, uh, exit price with some dilution. I'll return, you know, a huge portion of my fund, if not, it'd be a fund return. 
if they don't have a strategy and a clarity of thought of like how to capture those winners and and be really diligent uh, about that, then I just I'm not convinced you know how to make money at scale in this industry. I think it's also you know if I was to advocate on behalf of the, those managers, I would say a is it's a learnable skill totally, and two yeah. it's because they don't come from the finance side; they come from mm-hmm. the side. Yep, it's different strength. Okay. I agree. What would you like our audience to know about you, about top tier, and anything else you'd like to shine a light on? I'm down here in in New York now. If people thank you, yeah. If, if uh, any local managers are around uh, that want to meet, happy to uh, to get to know you over the, the coming months and all that. What's your criteria? Criteria? I mean, look, like we're probably going to watch for a fund, regardless. Like if we're just meeting you for the first time. It's just sorry, it's the reality of it, um, and and the business, the way the business works, but. Um, interesting people that uh, like on average our entry point for a group that isn't like a spin out like the moss and, and it's fund number three uh and so we don't have the smallest fund we've ever done 50 million in size roughly so i mean that's probably the ballpark of like when you become investable for us but you should probably meet us when you're raising your fund too how could gps benefit from meeting you early and talk to me about kind of building a relationship with lps well i hope people still have Think of us as as groups that knows what we're talking about, and we're going to shoot you straight, and we're not going to just like ask a bunch of questions and just like take some notes and say, "Hey, thanks for your time." We'll probably on the call be like, "Yeah, this is interesting." Like, you know, this sort of network that you're talking about, like, you know, a lot of people say it like that. What I think is unique and interesting about you is, and we'll try to give that feedback to people. Yeah, it's de- definitely not That's a waste of time. Up to them, yeah. um, you know, I think. One of the underrated people talk about pitching, uh, but one of the underrated things about meeting with with great LPs is actually evolving your strategy. You we, we just talked about it. Yeah, uh, portfolio construction, right? Mm-hmm. You're not born out of the womb knowing portfolio construction. It's a learnable skill. Um, so by meeting with smart LPs, you could actually improve your strategy. Uh, it's not just a matter of pitching or rephrasing and, you know, kind mm-hmm. of putting mm-hmm. lipstick on a pig. So I think, I think that's an underrated part of uh, fundraising. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. really appreciate you sitting down and, and Thanks for chatting. having me in person. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's great been a to pleasure. see you. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Thank you.